We have a, a series of three books, that doesn't mean that it has not been produced books before that, but three edited volumes that, uh, that we have produced over the last four years. Um, Moving Ahead with Red was first in 2008, focusing mainly on the global architecture. Some of the key issues that are still very relevant, I would say, like leakage, additionality, permanence, and so on. Um, in 2009, in Copenhagen, we presented a book called Realizing Red, which was a lot on the national level strategies, that red will need to embrace a broad set of policies in order to be effective. Uh, in 2009, CIFR also embarked on a large global comparative study of red. And, and this book that you can see now and have a hard copy, and of course go to the web and, and download it if you prefer to travel lightly, um, is our first kind of major output of this research project. Next. Um, kind of in, in the introduction we lay out, you know, RED has three phases. And you think of, of RED or any project, it, it goes through three phases and phases that you can do research on. The first concerns the design of RED. What should RED look like? What kind of policies? What are the institutions needed? MRV systems and so on. The second concerns the implementation of that. How, when RED as an idea enters the policy arena, how is it shaped, reshaped by the game going on? And that is what we call the political economy and implementation of RED. And the third, that it's still two, three, four years too early to do is to analyze the impact. Ask the question, does RED work? A lot of people ask, those of us involved in research. So after all, the bottom line, does red work? And the answer is, it's too early to say. And um, moving ahead and realizing red was kind of first generation outputs, with, where analyzing red now takes it to, this, to the second level, or second stage of looking at the political economy. What is the early experience of red projects? Next, please. Just a small overview of this global comparative study that um, that is, uh, has three major research components. The first being on, on the, the policies and policy implementation at the national level. It's headed by Maria Brockhaus, who is busy in another event um, and has been a co-editor of the book. The second, looking at red projects, headed by, by William Sanderlin to my left, on the red projects, the implementation of, of those projects, and quite detailed study to try to measure the impact with before, after, and control intervention sites. And the third, headed by Lou, is on monitoring and reference levels. How do we measure carbon and perhaps other things we want to measure related to the implementation, and not at least how to set reference level to provide the benchmark for assessing results and perhaps also for performance-based payments. Um, it's a huge project, as I said. I'm tempted to say, like the famous football coach, Jose Mourinho, when he was asked, are you the best football coach in the world? And he said, I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm just saying I don't know of anyone who is better. Um, it was, so we were asking, is this a, the largest kind of comparative research project? And we don't want to claim that, that uh, we, we are the, the largest project, but uh, we are not uh, aware of any that single larger other, other projects that, that has this kind of, of breadth and scope of this. Uh, but if you, if you know of that, please tell us in a gentle way. Uh, next, please. Um, of the countries that is involved, key focus has been on, on six countries. As you can see, those at the top here, Brazil, Peru, Cameroon, Tanzania, Indonesia, Vietnam, and then some activities, particularly component one in another uh, six countries that you also can read from the list. So, so quite diverse, trying to get two for intensive focus on each con continent and, and having all the major uh, forested countries, uh, particularly Brazil and Indonesia included. Next, please. Now, coming back to the book, as I said, it's a first stock taking because it, it's, it's going to continue, but it's good after two, three years to take stock, what have we learned? We split the book into three sections. The first one that I'm going to talk a little bit about is understanding red. And in order to do that, we developed something called the four eyes framework. When you get older, you, you have to find s small rules to remember things. And, and we developed these four eyes as a way to remember these institutions, interests, ideas, and information about it. 
The second that uh, is the biggest section and that Dion William is going to split is concerning implementing RED both at the national and at local levels. And the third on the measurement of RED. How do we measure this performance? Because RED is, is as you know, the uniquely about it is that it is to be result-based, performance-based, and therefore you need to measure these performances. Next, please. Um, the chapter two that Marie and I wrote, and that's not us being pictured here, by the way, is, um, is trying to see red through the four eyes, and we call it a political economy framework. Next, please. And how to achieve this transformational change that we say. Now, first, trying to define transformational change as a shift in the discourses in the attitudes, power relations, and deliberate policy and, and uh, protest action that leads policy formulation and implementation away from business as usual policy approach and directly reindered to support deforestation and degradation. So it's kind of the policy framework that makes it profitable to deforest rather than to conserve. That is a transformation change if you can change those institutions and policies away, making a live tree more valuable than a dead tree, to put it simple. So there are a few examples of this. And the, the, the interesting thing when you, when you discuss red, that in one hand we say that, okay, red to really uh, realize its full potential, you need this transformation change. You need to a new way of thinking, new way of approaching, we hear a lot. At the same time, red can also be a game changer and initiate some of this transformation change that I come back to. So it is really a chicken egg problem related to this. Next. Here's the framework, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but basically it's useful, and several chapters use this, that you have different policy arenas. And on these arenas you have actors, and they have their ideas, including certain ideologies, their beliefs, their discursive practices. And they have a set of information, and information is not just facts, it's how it's interpreted, it's how it's presented, and you extract information in a certain way to, to get it. And then they also have direct interests related to different ways of using the forest. And all this being embedded in a set of institutions. Now when you have these arenas, how can the outcome, the policy process lead to outputs or outcomes that, that uh, can lead to this transformation change that that we see as necessary to realize the full potential. Next, please. How to achieve this and kind of taking a little bit, not just a lot of what we have seen is what we term the business as usual forces that are in operation. Whether you look at Brazil or Indonesia or other countries, you see they mobilizing when it comes to the moratorium in Indonesia or the forest code in Brazil and, and similar proposed policy reforms in other countries. How can you get this change? And, and one is, is to go back to the very core idea of RED, that RED was about to change the economic incentives, to have an international financial systems, provide resources exogenous to the policy process and lead that to changing ideas. Um, the core the RED idea was exactly to, to kind of shift this benefit cost equation away from from making it uh, profitable to deforest rather to, to, to deforest or to forest conservation. Um, you may question, will this materialize? Well, ready can in principle be a win-win because it was meant that you fully compensate for the loss of forest by, or the loss of not being able to use the forest. You fully compensate. So local actors, well, they should be a win-win. We we get forest conservation and they should not lose income because they're fully compensated. That was the idea of RED five years ago or so when it was presented in Bali. Now, this is unlikely to happen for a number of reasons. First, large actors are likely to lose for many reasons. One is politically unacceptable, say, to use in uh, RED money, which is mainly coming from aid, aid uh, budgets, two-thirds so far is from aid budgets, to use them to compensate large palm oil companies of Indonesia or the, the, uh, the big cattle owners with 100,000 hectares of, of land in the Amazon. 
Um, at the same time, we don't think it's, it's enough money yet to fully compensate that. So it seems unrealistic. So it can change, provide new incentives, but it's unrealistic to think that there will not be losers. Next, please. Um, new ideas and information, and, and, and this new discourse about the value of forest has the potential of being a game changer. It's, I mean, some said nothing is as powerful as an idea whose right time has come, and, and red might be such an idea that just the very idea that forests are valuable, not just for the timber and for the agricultural land they provide, but also for the carbon stored in, in the biomass. Um, also, a lot of all the new issues has been focused on their indigenous local rights, governance, corruption, uh, and so on, that you, Red can kind of draw on these strong drives and, and gain momentum because they are making alliances with these forces. New actors and coalitions that we see, some are becoming more powerful and new coalitions are made in national policy arenas than, uh, that can be a driver of this change. But in the end, money speaks louder than words, so the, the basic financial incentives are critical for getting this long-term change. Next, please. Next. Thanks. Uh, just briefly, one chapter on the global economy that, that is a very strong reality of many of us, well, depending on which countries we are, that has really increased the exposure of forests to global trade and investments and really ex aggravated some of the historical trends of deforestation and degradation that we, that we have seen. Uh, in some, it makes red a lot more challenging because basically forests become valuable. So if you have the idea that you want to, to compensate for the cost of forest conservation, well, that is becoming more expensive when the demand for land increases. But there may also be opportunities, for example, influencing the market chains and, and using working through large multinational companies that are sensitive to consumer pressure. The implications for RED, well, as I said, it may be more expensive. You need to look at other policies that may not imply full compensation, but regulatory measures and so on. And also look at the demand side, not just the supply side of the RED countries. So this chapter by Pablo Pacheco and others, who's sitting here in the audience, gives a nice study of, of three regions in Brazil, Indonesia, and, and uh, East Africa. Next, please. The last chapter that I'm briefly going to talk about is one on the evolution of red. And, and one kind of you use as a, as a kind of shocking headline is to say that red has been an enormous success as an idea, you add. I mean, it, it has really taken off, and it's comparable to the sustainable development idea that was born in Rio 20 years ago, that RED has become such a kind of powerful idea that is highly debated by all of us in the room and a few thousand others. Um, why? Well, first of all, I think it's a good idea. Climate change is real. It has some very attractive features of being result-based with promises of large-scale funding and also a burden sharing that got getting the developing countries on board. It was also sufficiently broad to accommodate different interests, which has, is also important. We see that RED has developed, and maybe when I started to look back at some of the early reports five years ago, I mean, sometimes when you're in the business, you don't notice the change, isn't it? But starting to look back and see, wow, this is typically, it's as they are teenagers, so yesterday. It's, it's things that it was written five years ago and couldn't have been written today. And so red has really changed. Why? The absence of a new climate agreement is, is perhaps the most critical point to mention. Strong business as usual interest that red, as it really tried to sharpen and provide effective tools to limit deforestation degradation, it will also hurt some interests. A large number of actors with diverging agendas that is there and try to see red as a major source of funding and with different, very legitimate and very honorable interests and goals, but other than climate focus, I should say. And we're also learning from the field and from political battles. Next, please. Uh, so we look at red in four key ideas and in four areas, and I should be quite brief now. Next, please. Um, 
one of the objectives that RED has evolved from, from a CO2 or climate or carbon focus to strong focus on co-benefits. I used to say that the most uh, ironic illustration of this was a side event in Durban last year saying carbon as a co-benefit in RED. Um, policies, the original idea of having payment for environmental services moving to broad policies and measures and then over to forest policies. Uh, the broad PAMS that we thought would be a key point has not been implemented at the scale that one could hope because of this business as usual interest as we call. So the risk is that RED would resort to more sexual forest policies that a lot of studies over the last couple of decades show are not sufficiently strong to, to realize change. Scale from national to a local projects, funding, kind of saying rich countries paying poor countries, but a, a, a very large burden will be carried by the countries themselves. It's not by Norway or Australia or the EU or other countries, but it is by Brazil and Indonesia. And of course, initially, we thought that RED would be part of a Copenhagen protocol or a post-2012 agreement. No, it's mainly from aid, as I said. Next, please. So let me end up with a dilemma that kind of I realized as I was editing this book. And this is that RED has really attracted many actors with different agendas and ideologies. And each want to have a piece of the RED cake. So we have got a kind of a less focused and more diverse, kind of a pulverized RED agenda. With the risk of losing some of the initial good characteristics with significant large scale funding, result based and targeted towards emission reductions. So this is the risk. At the same time, if you study political economy, you would know that really the key for success is to build coalition with different agendas that can agree on one particular outcomes. So it's this dilemma to not diversifying and making less red effective, at the same time make it sufficiently broad and in the interest of sufficient many groups and actors in this political process to support it. So I think this is one of the major challenges that lies ahead when, when we want to go ahead with red. Thank you. Next, please. Can we put up the next slide, please? Okay. Our next speaker is Dai Resosodarmo, who will talk a bit about the experience with national level policy processes. Yeah. Could you go to the next slide, next please? Slide. Okay, so I'm going to start off with um, the first part of the second uh, part of the book, uh, which um, focuses on implementing RED. Um, I am going to go over the national level perspective and William is going to follow up on the local level perspective. So the first chapter in this section is on the politics and power of red national processes um, followed by the multi-level and multi-level challenges um, in doing red um, and then financing red and followed by who benefits and why. Next please. The chapter on the national, uh, the politics and power of national red processes uh, uses the political economy framework where the dimensions of institutional and political path dependencies, actors' interests, actors' ideas are looked at to see the, their interplay in the policy processes and how uh, they influence the policy processes and whether um, uh, the the processes allow or hinder um, changes from the business as usual to transformational change. Next please, thank you. So um, the chapter um, comes up with, four, uh, with three key messages. The first one is that RED requires four preconditions at least to overcome political economic hurdles. The first one is the relative autonomy of nation states. The second one is national ownership over red policy processes. The third is that inclusiveness is red is important. And also there's importance in the coalitions, uh, coalitions calling for transformational change. Um, the, the work has also found that um, if where international actors are only the actors that drive red 
it is um, challenging to formulate and implement national red strategies. So it is challenging without support from domestic or local constituencies um, and without um, national ownership of the processes. Um, new coalitions breaking up for institutional, uh, breaking up institutional and political path dependencies will certainly also need the participation of state elites and business actors. Next. Okay, so this chapter uh, looks also at the actors uh, shaping the policy discourse using the media analysis. We can see the differences in the uh, six and the seven uh, countries, for instance, in Indonesia, Bolivia and Vietnam state actors um, express their red positions in the media and therefore are shaping the policy discourse while in um, uh, in uh, Nepal uh, the actors are uh, uh, civil society is more prominent next please okay the next uh, chapter is on a uh, uh, scales of governance where multi-levels uh, and multiple uh, there are multiple challenges for red the key messages from this chapter is that first of all red is a multi-level endeavor so the interconnections of global demands national and subnational structures and also local people's needs and aspirations must be ensured um, sound information flows uh, uh, is important um, enhancing and the um, harmonization between local and national levels are essential, for instance, for accountable MRV and leakage control, two core issues in red. Um, across the levels, uh, sound information flows uh, is also important across the levels uh, because it can increase negotiation powers of disadvantaged groups. Um, and uh, to ensure the three E's, uh, the effectiveness, uh, efficiency, then, and equitable uh, for uh, in red. And uh, the other key uh, issue is that red multi-level governance systems uh, must match incentives and interests with also transparent institution um, in order to reduce conflicts um, among uh, the levels. Next, please. Okay, this is small, uh, it's hardly uh, probably difficult to see, but um, some uh, our, of the primary evidence from the global comparative study shows the differences in the, um, in the uh, progress of, of each of the countries in terms of MRV and leakage that has, uh, that's related to the multi-level governance mechanisms. For instance, in Brazil, they have already advanced technique in MRV, um, and um, the MRV systems are in place, uh, but uh, still needing um, uh, third-party uh, verification is ongoing. In, uh, in terms of leakage, um, Vietnam and Indonesia are uh, uh, different. Uh, for instance, Vietnam, there's weak coordination among relevant agencies, but in Indonesia, they are still struggling with regional and local political games affecting the um, uh, leakage. Next, please. Okay, the next uh, chapter is on financing red. Uh, this uh, diagram shows that uh, the four sources of um, red financing, which is international public, national public, private, international private, and national private. And uh, for international public financing, usually is used for readiness support, for policy support, and for um, results-based payments where national public financing um, is gone from budgetary support or extra budgetary support. But we should go to the next um, slide, maybe. Okay, so in terms of financing red, uh, where are we? Uh, Short-term finances um, are available, however, disbursements are slow and investment opportunities are scarce. Um, and then there's no adequate and predictable long-term strategy to meet red financial needs, at least uh, currently. In the interim phase, with no ambitious climate change mitigation goals, red finance will be mobilized by the public sector, and thus it thus will be likely to be fragmented and channeled through various agencies. So we need to fi test financing options that leverage private sector finance and then that directly uh, addresses um, deforestation and degradations. 
What are the options for financing? For middle income countries, they can opt to self-finance, for instance, engaging in results-based agreements with donors and international agencies. But for more fragile states, uh, they might like to rely on the overseas development assistance type finances, um, either combining financial support, technical assistance, and policy guidance. Next. Now, um, we go to the other chapter, which is uh, the benefit sharing, um, um, who should benefit and why uh, from RED. Um, this chapter uh, uh, finds that designing effective benefit sharing mechanisms for RED must first determine what RED seeks to achieve see as the objective. So we must first determine the objectives because the objectives affect the design and benefit uh, and cost sharing mechanisms. The second um, important finding is that benefits are not only financials. Only a few red projects are providing direct financial transfers, so that benefit sharing actually must tend to a wide range of activities, not only um, financial benefits. So the legitimacy of the decision-making institutions and processes is critical in the benefit sharing. The first one is legal clarity. There should be consensus on which institutions have the right to make decisions, and then procedural uh, rights have to be attended to as well. Next, please. This chapter um, uh, has, uh, has a discussion, a uh, strong discussion on discourses on who should benefit. So where um, effectiveness and efficiency discourses versus equity discourses, it is more focused on the equity discourses. There are four discourses that have been advanced. The first one is whether benefits should go to actors with legal rights. The second is whether benefits should go to low emitting forest stewards. The third is whether they should go to those incurring costs. And the fourth one is whether benefits should go to the effective implementers. Next. So some, uh, this chapter also gives some examples of potential red beneficiaries and the costs and benefits they may accrue. So um, from you know, the providers of red services as potential red beneficiaries all the way to village associations, municipal local governments and agencies, cent lo uh, local governments uh, to central government and even the public. And you can see the various um, possible roles and costs incurred as well as uh, the, just the example of benefits. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so I'd like to now pass the, the microphone to William Sunderland, who will talk a bit about what has been learned from the demonstration activities of, of RED that have been uh, tried in, in a number of countries. William? Thank you, Lou. Next slide, please. Part of part two I will examine covers uh, four chapters that concern why tenure matters at the subnational project level. Um, a chapter on red projects being uh, combining old forest management techniques as, as well as those that are new and that fall under the label red. Um, a third chapter uh, based on a global comparative study and based on interviews with local stakeholders on their hopes and worries about RED and how it will evolve. And a fourth chapter on the landscape location of RED projects and what that implies about their ultimate effectiveness. Next slide, please. <coughs> in our research uh, in six countries on, on tenure, uh, at at that point, when we did the research, it was at 19 projects. We found that um, local proponents, project proponents, are across the board making fairly serious efforts to address serious problems concerning tenure at the local level. And in spite of the fact that there has been unprecedented, un unprecedented tenure to forest tenure through RED, in fact, at the national level, there's been very little action that we can consider fundamental and that measures up to the challenge proposed, uh, posed by RED. And as such, you have a situation where project proponents are often pretty much going it alone and trying to resolve um, at the local level tenure problems that have their origin um, far beyond the, uh, the boundaries of the project and that ought to be faced at a national or resolved at a national level. 
and uh, these national level institutions are often inadequate to address such problems as the contestation between um, the customary vision of forest tenure and the statutory uh, outlook on what is proper and right. And in the final analysis, we believe that these big picture problems that uh, need to precede the implementation of RED, such as addressing the underlying causes of deforestation and degradation uh, at the level of the country and addressing tenure issues ought to be addressed in parallel. And yet, because both of these tend to challenge uh, the business as usual model of economics, there is resistance against them that slows down action on these uh, issues. Next slide, please. Um, here to illustrate what I've just said is some information about the six core countries where we're carrying out our, our research. In the ideal case, um, preceding the implementation of RED, you would have a clear determination um, of rights for local stakeholders and fairly strong local level ownership or access rights. And among these countries, we have a very uneven picture. In Brazil, we have the, the, the strongest percentage of the forest estate uh, where um, forest tenure is in, in the hands of local people. And um, in most of the other countries, it's really quite weak. So we have a, a far from ideal situation uh, at the outset. Next slide, please. And here to further illustrate among these six countries, I just want to point out that though local stakeholders believe they have or ought to have the right uh, to exclude outsiders from making claims on their local forests, uh, we have a situation where at the time of the research there were active claims, outside claims on local forests um, at most of the project sites. And most worrisome for the implementation of RED at one out of every five of the villages uh, where we've, we're conducting our research, the experience is that local managers of forests have tried and failed to exclude something. And as you can imagine, if the idea of red rests on the probability or the certainty of local managers being able to assure that forests won't remain standing in perpetuity, an inability to deal with outside claims on local forests is quite key. Next slide, please. Uh, the chapter following this um, analyzes something that we discovered about a year ago, which is that at all of our project sites, there is a combination of old or um, um, forest management approaches that predate RED, and we'll call it uh, integrated conservation and development. And by that, we mean specifically combining restricting access to forests and compensating local people by providing livelihood alternatives or livelihood supports. So this idea tends to exist in RED, and what is distinctively new about RED at the local level is the idea of payment for environmental services. And so there is the intention of combining both of these. And this hybrid model between the old and the new has both advantages and disadvantages from the point of view of the proponent. Given that the international conditions and the, the absence of a, a robust forest carbon market, uh, that's a condition that prevails right now. Project proponents can at least make progress by, f by following the ICDP model. Um, and in the events that they decide not to go with PES, then the ICDP work that they do can serve as a fallback. And yet, this in itself presents a challenge because as we know, ICDP as a forest management approach has had plenty of trouble over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And because um, project proponents are very reluctant to raise expectations about local, at the local level, especially as, regard to the, as regards the future potential stream of uh, financial benefits that would come from PES. There's an emerging problem where some, about a third of our sample sites, the proponents have not fully discussed um, PES at the local level. 
and this presents possible future problems because of course they would need to to get um, local permission for a new idea and that means having to go back and re-explain red in different terms next slide please uh, here's some of the data just to ex illustrate what I was just talking about um, we asked the proponents among the three major categories of intervention in red projects, if we look at those as restricting forest access and providing alternative livelihoods and pests, we ask them, which do you believe is ultimately going to have the most powerful effect on protecting forests? And somewhat surprisingly, they tend to focus on alternative livelihoods rather than, than, than pests. Um, I have my thoughts on why that happened, but I won't explain it right right now. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, a chapter following the one I just discussed is is one where we have data on hopes and worries from the point of view of the villagers, the local s stakeholders. And what we found is that, um, well, first I'll just say briefly that we um, went to these sites very early, certainly before um, red interventions were introduced in the form of PASS. And in fact, PASS has almost not been implemented an anywhere. But we went early enough that in, in many places the proponents had not yet done education or outreach about what, what they intend. And so this, these data here are based on the subsample uh, projects where respondents uh, did actually have some knowledge about the RED project. And what we, they, we found is that they, they, they view RED as fundamentally focused on con forest conservation objectives, and yet their worries and concerns tend to focus, uh, perhaps logically enough, on their, their own stake in, in red, and that often uh, relates to their own uh, well-being and their, their income and making sure that red does not harm them in any way. And we, f we found that although there are very earnest off efforts to do community outreach and early education and to follow through on free prior and informed content, uh, consent, that there are communication gaps that are causes uh, our cause for concern at RED projects, uh, leading us to say that, that it's, it's quite urgent that proponents communicate early and clearly to villagers, um, and that in cases where this is not done, that they involve uh, local people meaningfully in design and implementation, and that a better effort be made to balance forest protection uh, goals with welfare concerns at the local level. Next slide, please. Here's some data uh, illustrating uh, the points that were just, just made. Um, these are data uh, essentially showing that uh, local people are, have internalized the view passed on by, uh, by proponents that RED is, is fundamentally directed at forest uh, conservation and protection. Next slide, please. And yet, if we decompose the, the data that we have on their hopes and worries, the center of gravity of their hopes and worries has to do with uh, income from, uh, improvement and making sure that there are no uh, um, negative outcomes concerning their well-being. Next slide, please. And now I'm turning to the last chapter in this, this section, having to do with the location of uh, forest carbon projects, including RED. Um, we found that across our catalog of, of uh, forest carbon projects around the world, uh, going across m many countries, that the tendency is for, for forest carbon projects to be located in countries with a fairly high biodiversity index and within country boundaries, they tend to be located in jurisd uh, jurisdictions with more protected area, um, which basically supports the notion that there is some, from at least a, um, a biophysical point of view, that, uh, that red projects are located where they ought to be. 
And supporting this notion is that we find in the two biggest red countries, Brazil and Indonesia, that red projects tend to be located in areas of higher deforestation and areas of higher uh, forest carbon densities. And the, um, please go back to the, the last slide. Could you back it up once? Okay. Um, in our six country studies, um, we found that the sample villages um, tend to rely heavily on agriculture, which emphasizes the point that red is faced with a fundamental challenge of how to balance uh, local um, dependence on agriculture with um, the way in which agricultural development challenges the goals of red. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a map showing the, the density of red projects aco uh, across um, uh, the world. I know it's hard to see, but it's essentially a map of, of um, where the redder the color, the more dense the, the presence of, of red projects. And um, those with a star are those uh, red project sites where we've conducted our research. Next slide, please. Okay, and these are the data, um, the background data, essentially uh, showing how we've concluded that um, there is, uh, that red projects tend to be uh, located in places where they are needed from a biophysical point of view. So for example, in this, the second row, the, in Brazil and Indonesia, the deforestation rate um, is higher in places with red than in areas without red. Uh, uh, suggesting the, the potential for additionality. Next slide, please. Okay. Next slide, please. The final section of the book deals with measuring red performance. Next slide, please. Um, chapter 13 of the book talks about performance indicators for red plus implementation. Okay, so, um, red, red is essentially a uh, payment for performance scheme, which and this applies that there must be assessments of results for Red Plus programs. But in different phases of the the uh, implementation, are going to require different types of performance indicators. So in the readiness phase, support will have to go for policy reforms rather than for proven emissions reductions. Um, and so we need good performance indicators. Um, in, in this phase, as, as, as much as we do in the phase where we're actually trying to assess uh, uh, emissions reductions. So there are valuable lessons on, on governance indicators that can be learned from the aid sector. Um, and, and so we, we need to avoid seeking perfect indicators and we need to, to use uh, expert judgment extensively. It's not always about quantifying emissions reductions and certainly not in all stages of, of red implementation. Next slide, please. So challenges for, for coming up with appropriate indicators. First of all, indicators need to be there to help monitor results, okay? But they also must be credible to, to stakeholders, okay? And they have to be appropriate for the objectives of what we're trying to accomplish. And, and those objectives are actually different in each phase of Red Plus implementation. Next, uh, next please. The rationale, there's both a management rationale. Indicators are required to help keep efforts on track but they're also required for evaluation purposes to assess success of actions. Next, please. Lessons from ODA experience suggest that for, for a number of reasons, there are, there are timing constraints with uh, setting in place indicators. For financial reasons and, and for, for project management reasons, the timing of assessment is often on the, required is often on the order of three to five years. But we know that, that Incomes and outpacks in natural re impacts in, in natural resource management usually happen on a scale of 10 to 15 years and perhaps beyond that. The further we get out in time from the actions, the harder specific attribution becomes. Okay? And the reliability of information with uh, around which we put together the indicators is also a, a, a major constraint that we need to, to factor into to what we're putting together. Next, please. So as we, we look at, I got the photo better over there. Um, if we look at, at, for example, 
the, 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 across the top we have the different phases. So phase one of RED implementation is readiness, phase two are policy measures, phase three is, is results-based action. The implementation metrics are likely to change as we go through that. So for example, in the fa readiness phase, we're gonna have input indicators. This could be readiness funds dispersed, this could be uh, consultations that have been undertaken. Um, we could have output indicators like pilot projects that have been developed and are, and are operating, um, RPPs that have been approved. In phase two, we may move more to performance metrics. And here we'd be looking more at output uh, indicators, um, strategies and policies, uh, laws that are adopted, institutions, so for example, for MRV institutions that are put in place, institutions for, for benefit sharing that have been put into place. In phase three, we're gonna be moving more towards outcome and impact indicators. So there we'll, is where we'll be looking at gross deforestation or the increased share of, of uh, restored forest in the native areas. Um, we'll be looking at, at uh, trying to quantify cover. Um, and we'll be looking at impact indicators, you know, quantified changes in carbon emissions. So going across the bottom, we have sort of the results change, moving from input to output to outcomes and impact. And the different phases of, of uh, RED implementation are going to require different phases of, of indicators, or different types of indicators. Next, please. <clears throat> Chapter 14 looks at baselines and monitoring in local RED Plus projects. Um, the main conclusions of the, the chapter are that robust standards and methods have been developed to estimate emissions from deforestation at the project level. Um, because baseline and monitoring methodologies were adopted only recently, many pilot projects do not comply. Okay, and that's an important finding. The next generation of, of projects should identify and develop suitable methodologies before investing in the development of their baselines and before putting in place their MRV systems. Next, please. So the IPCC has developed the, the measurement methods that serve as a basis for a number of standards. Um, there, there are six VCS, one, two, three, four, five VCS uh, uh, methodologies that have already been put in place for, for uh, avoided plan land use change, mosaic deforestation. Um, the American Carbon Registry has uh, a framework module and, and sub-modules for, for different types of deforestation. Um, these, these, so these IPCC methods have been recognized as part of the UNSCC process and, and a number of organizations um, that, are, that are putting in place standards are using them as the, the basis for uh, greenhouse gas inventories. Next, please. Next, please. Okay. Um, so we looked at a, sur a survey of 17 demonstration projects, um, and we find that most of these projects do not meet the requirements either for VCS or the, the ACR. For example, um, prior land use change, or land use is often difficult to verify in a spatially explicit way in these projects. Projects tend to limit monitoring to the project areas. They don't have reference areas. They don't have leakage belts. They wouldn't meet VCS requirements, for example. Nine of the 17 projects developed modeled hist historical rates of deforestation in the project area, and three others are in the process. So, so reasonably good performance at that level. Only three of the 17 projects use spatial models to project the location of future deforestation. The other 14 rely on expert knowledge. Um, 13 projects have remote sensing images from more than, than three points in time. Uh, over the 10 year period. Um, seven, only seven of the 17 projects have the high resolution data and all, most, all of the projects are working with medium resolution uh, remote sens sensing data. Next please. Um, in chapter 15 we looked at uh, the emissions factors um, and, as a, and emissions factors are important for converting estimates of land use change into carbon dioxide emis uh, emissions estimates. <coughs> Uh, first of all, that we find that the, the lack of data limits converting area estimates, uh, estimates of deforestation and, and degradation into carbon stock changes in most tropical countries. Okay? The institutional capacity to conduct inventories and measurements for improving greenhouse gas inventories in all agricultural, forestry, and other land uses has been slow in non-NX1 countries. Okay? And the constraints, constraints need to be overcome through investments in productive partnerships between technical services in Red Plus countries intergovernmental agencies, um, advanced research institutes, and there's an awful lot of potential for South-South exchange of, of knowledge in these areas. There are several countries that are actually fairly well advanced um, that, that could serve as, as uh, means for, for te uh, technology and, and knowledge transfer. Next, please. So the, the chapter looks at, at two approaches for <coughs> Two approaches for, for estimating emissions factors and, and, and evaluates the, the uh, level of knowledge to do that. The, the first is the, the gain loss method where you know, carbon stock, changes in a carbon stock are the results of, of both inputs and outputs. Next please. Or changes in carbon stocks can be assessed 
by measuring the stock at, at, at two different times and looking at the change. These are the two IPCC approaches to estimating emissions factors or developing emissions factors for specific land uses. Um, and, and some are more appropriate for some types of emissions factors. For example, the, the, um, the gain loss approach is much more appropriate for things like peatlands. Um, and that's a, a practice or a, a, an approach that many research um, efforts are taking into to, uh, account. The stock difference is very, very it's appropriate for things like above ground biomass. And we have a number of, of inventory based approaches being developed for that. Next, please. <coughs> Chapter 16 builds upon some work that we've, we've done and, and published in the project already on the stepwise framework for developing uh, Red Plus reference emissions levels. Um, the main conclusions are that the development of reference emissions levels is constrained by the lack of quality data. Data availability and data quality need to be used to determine the methods for setting reference emissions levels. Okay, consideration of drivers of deforestation and degradation are going to be important for adjusting the reference emissions levels to national circumstances. And the idea here is that the poorer the quality of your data, the more you have to count on your data. Okay, and it's a bit of a paradox, but if you think about it, if you really don't have good data, you should not engage in complex modeling. So if you don't have quality data, you can't use very sophisticated approaches. Keep it simple when you don't have a lot of, of information. Um, the stepwise approach for developing reference emissions levels it is one approach to facilitate broad participation um, for early startup and motivation. Um, it, it, it's, it allows for early startup and, and provides the motivation for improvements over time. Um, and this can be done alongside efforts to enhance measurement and, and monitoring capacities of, of countries. Next, please. This is the stepwise approach sort of laid out in a schematic format. What it does is it shows how to integrate a number of different data sources. Um, and we, we've uh, published this uh, several months ago um, and presented this at the, the expert workshop. And this serves as the basis for the, the decision in Durban on the stepwise approach to reference emissions level. It shows how different approaches to set using activity data, integrating that with emissions factors, integrating that with knowledge and, and information on, on drivers of deforestation. Um, and how we might go about adjusting for inert national circumstances and, and integrating uncertainty um, at each step of Red Plus implementation. So, so in phase one, where things are very general and, and we're trying to just get a handle on, on uh, uh, the, mag the order of magnitude of, of emissions, we could go with very simple approaches that are not spatially disaggregated using tier one global default factors from IPCC and, and using very simple rules for adjustments. When we get to phase three and we're talking about performance uh, payments for performance, we need to ha actually have spatially disaggregated data. We need to have um, spatially explicit methods, methods for, for uh, understanding dry and projecting drivers. Next, please. <coughs> what the chapter then does is expand upon this stepwise approach and links the, the uh, reference emissions level setting to the financial incentive baseline. So the, the business as usual baseline is based upon uh, historical deforestation and forest degradation, and then integrates information about uh, national circumstances, um, and, and in particular uh, drivers at, uh, in different regions of countries. Next, please. We then integrate national circumstances for, for what's called the financial incentive baseline. So, so we, th this is where you would integrate um, aspects of, of uh, national capabilities, um, other considerations, for example, efficient use of funding, um, uncertainty, to, to move from a, a baseline uh, ba uh, based upon business as usual to a financial incentive benchmark from which you know, payments would begin. So you may not always pay a country as soon as at, at the first emissions reductions, for example, Indonesia has committed to 26% emissions reductions by itself and asked for additional payments uh, or additional support to, to go beyond that to, to 41%. So this is, this is the, we've laid out in this chapter the approach of how that might work. Next, please. Chapter 17 looks at safeguards um, in national policy discourse and, and pilot projects. The main conclusions from this chapter are that red policymakers, um, project personnel, and investors value red plus safeguards, um, and that's a good thing. Uh, to gain national level buy-in for red plus safeguards, national sovereignty must be recognized, um, and competing safeguard policies should be harmonized. Okay? The red plus safeguards dialogues needs to move towards action, including um, this includes introducing guidelines, um, low-cost strategies, and capacity building to support the the interpretation of the safeguards. Next, please. 
some of the key findings. <coughs> okay, the Red Plus safeguards are a set of norms or institutions that guide expectations surrounding social environmental outcomes of red. Um, several international and nonprofit organizations have articulated safeguard standards for Red Plus policies at the national level. For example, the FCPF has a, has a, a policy on this. Um, countries have little capacity to monitor social and biodiversity impacts. So we've already talked about the low capacity to measure and monitor carbon. This also extends to measuring the social um, and biodiversity impacts of red activities. Um, and there's uneven compliance with safeguards in demonstration projects at the moment. Next, please. So, so just to conclude, um, I think we, we can sum up the five key messages um, from in, in the book. First of all, to, to come back to the, the message that Harold offered us at the beginning, red as an idea is a success story. Okay, there's significant results-based funding to address an urgent need for climate change mitigation. Um, it's sufficient, sufficiently broad to serve as a canopy under which a wide range of actors can grow their own trees. Okay, next please. Um, but red faces huge challenges. There are powerful political and economic interests at stake and a powerful political and economic interest in the business as usual deforestation. Um, coordination across various government levels and agencies is required. It's not always the Ministry of Forestry that, that, um, that governs the activities that are the main source of deforestation. In fact, it rarely is. Um, the benefits to balance, uh, there's a required a need to benefit to, to balance effectiveness and, and equity in benefits, okay, so, so and, and going back to the, the uh, chapter on, on benefit sharing and, and some of the discourses that are going on around that. Tenure insecurity and safeguards must be genuinely addressed, okay, and there's a need for transparent institutions, reliable carbon monitoring, realistic reference levels um, if we're going to build results-based systems. Next, please. Next. So Red Plus requires and can catalyze transformational change. New economic incentives, new information and discourses, new actors, new policy coalitions all have the potential to move domestic policies away from the business as usual tra trajectory. Next, please. Red Plus projects are hybrids at the moment, um, and they are taking place in high deforestation areas. There's a mix of enforcement of regulations and, and support, to support to alternative livelihoods, particularly through the ICDP model. Um, but also through uh, results-based incentives and, and payments for environmental services models. Projects are located in high deforestation, high forest carbon areas, and these high, this yields um, high additionality if they succeed. Next, please. Um, and there are no, no regret policy options, okay? We are building political support and coalitions for change. Um, so, so with or without RED, if, re if RED is successful or sustainable, these coalitions will still exist. Um, we are investing in, in adequate information systems or, or improving information systems, and, and with or without RED, we're still going to help uh, better manage the, the forest estate and the forest resources. Um, and we're implementing pi policies that are desirable regardless of the climate change objectives. So, so a lot of what we're trying to accomplish, or a lot of what is being accomplished in early actions, um, are good with or without the climate change benefits and are good for, for sustainable management of forests. 